the opportunities to relearn what your parents couldn't tell you weren't there. So what was disconnected kind of just stayed disconnected. Grandma came out and she just grabbed me and just like burst into tears and she just couldn't stop crying. Just meeting love again. Like love was a person with two legs and two arms. If we don't love who we are, it can make our journey and the opportunities we have much more reduced because we aren't willing to draw from or to be part of a side of our life. We want to retain our individuality as a race. If judged by your standards, we fall short. Does it matter very much whether we square up with the parking house standards or not? Reeves, Kia ora, I'm Isla Reeves. I'm a teacher aide, a te reo Māori student, a poet and a musician. I want to help people because they can't think of another way of being alive. In my family, like probably in a lot of Māori whānau, there's a certain amount of shame or whakamā that people have about disconnection to te ao Māori. And I remember my dad telling me that he went to school and he got asked to write down his iwi because he was registered as a Māori student and he wrote down Martin, which is like the family last name. I was for a long time one of about two Māori students in our primary school of 400. The opportunities to relearn what your parents couldn't tell you weren't there, so what was disconnected kind of just stayed disconnected. I did Japanese as my language choice in my first year of high school, and as much as I liked it, I kept looking at the Māori class, which was directly across the hallway, and being like, I should be in that class. <laughs> I reckon I had this calling to be a part of Te Ao Māori and to recognise my own um, Māori-ness or whatever. <laughs> it's quite difficult to find a starting point for my journey with mental illness. When I was little, I was very, very scared of a lot of things, but also had this like outrageously confident, energetic, very manic side of my personality. There were times I was literally flinging myself around the lounge, like cartwheeling on the couches until like four in the morning. And then other times where I was really exhausted and nervous and I'd get all shaky and stuff. As I got into my teenage years, that was when it became apparent that I did have extreme highs and extreme lows. Because I couldn't really control that and I didn't know what it was, I developed all sorts of ways that I would deal with that, so I felt like I had a sense of control. Being yeah, restrictive about my eating or being obsessive about having things like laid out in perfect order. So when I first got taken to a psychiatrist when I was about 14, I wasn't shocked when they said bipolar disorder. They don't often diagnose 14 year olds with bipolar disorder. And I suppose that was when everything really began.
with mania, it creates a complete lack of fear or inhibition, which is the main danger of mania. You're on top of the world, and you can do anything, and there's no possible way that you could get harmed. You're completely invincible. You can hear things that aren't there, you can see things that aren't there, and it's just a really terrifying experience. With wings of Jerusalem, baptise this, the snarling dog of hell bent heaven. They all for days sun, they said, and then they didn't. Fled to the big smoke, sky tower syringe, piercing Ranginui and getting him high and higher, until the flood encouraged itself, and she will come to rehab with us, and to the doctor's clinic with the brown faces on the wall singing, another one bites the dust. I was 18 and I moved up to Auckland to start a Māori development degree and ended up having to come home after like a week of university and got put in hospital. I was in the adult ward. If I had been just a couple of months younger, I would have been put into the youth ward. It was a very, very scary experience. There was a Pukinga Atawhai, or a Māori mental health worker, who was assigned to me. It was her job to advocate for me as a Māori person, and she was always encouraging of my music. She was telling me, go to a writing thing. If you can get a few hours leave, go do that. She came to help me as a person, and she didn't have any agenda or any goal. When I was in hospital, I wrote quite a bit. I think I wrote probably out of a desire to document everything, because you're just in this horrible, but also just weird and foreign situation. So writing kind of makes it familiar. But I also did feel like everything was probably at its most intense at that time, which meant that writing about it was easier, because I wasn't having to like dig out what I was trying to say. I came out of that experience and I entered uh, Rising Voices, which is a New Zealand spoken word competition for young people under 25. And I won the Christchurch one with a poem that I'd written about being in hospital. And I guess that to me made it quite clear that I could make something quite like beautiful and abstract out of a really awful experience. Can you imagine when Isla was younger, she yeah. never stayed still, always on the go. It was a terrible journey for her, but she's gone from being this hyperactive child who had this energy and intensity that sometimes I felt was sort of almost dangerous because you didn't know where it was going to go. She's just settled in her mind and calm. Coming out the other side, it became super clear to me what I did want to do to help people. So I became a teacher aide and uh, started working with a fantastic young man and helping him at school. And then that kind of, yeah, gave me some insight into the world of education and the world of mental health. Because when you're working with a young person who's not well, you're undoubtedly helping them also with that. Feeling that she was doing something worthwhile and that she had something to offer, that seemed to be the beginning of her getting better. It's like a cliche that we do things better when we're together, but it's also very true. And if we're not helping and supporting other people, it kind of leaves the world in a weird kind of individual mindset, which is really not what I'm about. I'm about the community and, and connection. Being able to like help someone else on a journey that you've already been on kind of rounds things off in a nice way.
kua kore e rerekei a tātou. Mena kaore e tau te katia. Being raised by a white man, but then having a black mother, there were some things about me that are white tendencies, and then there were things inside of me that are black tendencies. And then I got into music, or well, music got into me. Communication breakdown now, I'm guessing. Playing all these games got me stressing. My name is Tali Angelus Jenkinson, and I release music under the name of Valet. I live in Christchurch, and mum is from PNG, and dad is British born in Christchurch, New Zealand. I was born in Papua New Guinea. One of the best ways I can describe it is diverse. There's over 150 languages, and each province is almost like its own mini country within the country. Very, very diverse, very colourful. When the main city, Port Moresby, developed, a lot of people came to the city as a means to pursue opportunity for like business, and so they formed these things and they call them settlements. It basically set up temporary houses. The standard of living in these settlements is very, very low. They're very, very dangerous. Crime rates are super, super high and just, I guess, real conducive for disease to spread. The main reason why I left PNG when I was young was to seek healthcare. I got malaria, which is a big killer around the world, as well as Papua New Guinea. I was in the early stages of developing rickets and that's when your body's not getting the nutrition, the bones aren't getting the nutrition and calcium that it needs. And so they can start curving and growing out of shape. I needed to come to New Zealand to receive life-saving treatment. Growing up in New Zealand was complex. Looking different, being different, sounding different, being from a different country to the majority heaps of memories about being teased about having curly hair, like having an afro was like the most uncool thing. I remember straightening my hair just to fit in. It's like real awkward to mention now because you just feel like you're just like, now nah, rock my afro. But at the time you're like, this is my biggest issue. It's so funny because like nowadays everyone wants to have an afro, it's just the, the most hilarious thing. And I'm just like sitting on the sideline and the people come up to me and they're like, oh, how do I get your hair? Is your hair natural? And I was just like, or you gotta go for like 10 years of bullying and then you can have this. <laughs> I don't gotta love, get these people from me. I know what they want, they wanna come on me. They ain't got it. I first started getting to music. Dad always tells me this memory of him playing Van Morrison. And he said that since I'd, I'd come from a place of trauma and I wasn't expressive when I was younger. And then the moment that he played Van Morrison, his words were I came out of my shell. I was cutting hair at my first job. I was 17 years old and a Filipino kid walked in off the street. I'd released one song on SoundCloud. He'd heard my song somehow. I have no idea. I'd never met this dude ever before. So I was just like weirded out that this dude found my music and then also that he liked my music and then he's like wanted to record me for free. In 2018, I released my debut single, Under Valet. The song's called Love Me. It did really well, received radio airplay on the mainstream radio stations. I think more potent than that was people's response to it when they heard it and how it made them think about their story and their identity and their relationship with their parents and what that meant for them. So I, like deep in the most part of me, wanted to go to Papua New Guinea and was curious, but that was like shelved in layers and layers of like hurt and mistrust. 
I think because mum was young, there were drugs involved, she wasn't the greatest parent, and so the example of a Papua New Guinean person to me, it wasn't something that was desirable to know about because of the demonstration that mum gave me as a young child. 2019 was the first time that I went back home to Papua New Guinea and the experience was overwhelming and hard to explain. I wasn't sure what the family felt about me, about my side of the family, what they had been told from my mum. I walked out and then I just saw them and then I got really shy. I was like, they don't want to see me. I've been so far from my culture for such a long period of time. And then auntie ran up, my uncle was there, and then there were just heaps of extended family. There would have been nearly 20 people there. And then grandma comes, and this is where that emotion really hit me. His grandma came out and she just grabbed me and just like burst into tears and she just couldn't like stop crying. She just clenched me real tight, just meeting love again. Like, love was a person with two legs and two arms. <laughs> Seeing my face and my DNA, like, oh, he's got my eyebrows, there's my nose. I learned lots of things. There is beauty in the Papua New Guinea inside of me. I learned that there was beauty in it. And I saw the beauty firsthand. Everything that was like missing and all these questions that I had were like answered and all of a sudden I just had this intense pride. For anyone that's and any cultural predicament where there's identity is like a confusing thing. You have to go home, like you have to go home. And I won't be able to tell you exactly what it will do for you because it's different for everyone. But I just know like it won't be something that you'll regret. Like your eyes will be opened and it'll have this rich feeling of home. It takes you to unlearn things that you thought you knew about your culture maybe. And you just have to lay them down and um, realize that those things are identified in everyone's culture and you just need to be there to receive what is beautiful. Maharara nei koe, kua aha ahau. Mena i faia ki taku katoa. Saamons and Pacific people are the worst people in the world. I wish I wasn't Samoan. I couldn't aspire to be Pacific and to be successful. I think to be white was to be successful. Lover, Josiah is my name. I live here in Ōtotahi in Christchurch. Afakasi Samoan. My dad's from Apia in Samoa and moved to New Zealand when he was 17 and mum's a European Australian and she moved to New Zealand just before she was five. When I was a kid, very few Samoan people, very few Pacific people that I could see around me, I felt really embarrassed about being Samoan because of the statistics that I saw on TV. I remember one of the, the most influential shows on TV at that time was Police 107 and pretty much the description, 22, brown, Māori or Pacific. That's all I could see Samoan people, Pacific people were. So yeah, this is Parklands. I, thought, I can't remember when we moved here, but it must have been like when I was about six or seven maybe. We would all sort of play together on the streets, really our playground. <laughs> I, definitely as a kid, I participated in the racist um, jokes that other people would say about other people. 
I made jokes about my own communities. And I guess I looked at the stats and the stories that people told about us and couldn't see anything worth trying to cling to and so joined the majority. And I look at that now and think that was, yeah, I wish I had, had the courage to not have done that. When I was 14, there was a really big event here in Christchurch called the Pacific Youth Parliament. And me as someone who hadn't accepted that I was Samoan at the time. It's kind of probably a bit strange that I put my hand up, but it was my mum who encouraged me to go for it. That was amazing to suddenly feel completely embraced, completely accepted for who I was. It didn't matter that I hadn't had the opportunities to learn about my Samoan heritage or our Pacific communities when I was a kid. Now I had all these new friends, you know, who were Fijian, who were Tongan, who were Samoan, who were New Wayan, and I guess beforehand, I, I couldn't even really say I had one Pacific friend. So that was, that was huge. Changed my life. I made these new friends who were Pacific and we started this charity to increase Pacific youth voice in our city. And then we started to hear from Pacific young people that the biggest problem was belongingness. Like 60% of us are born in New Zealand and to be born in New Zealand means, you know, you come with not necessarily clarity on how we're supposed to fit in here. Suicide was a big challenge for Pacific young people. More Pacific young men die by suicide than by road accidents. We started to host a couple of events so that we could help teach Pacific young people who might hear really horrific stories from their friends know how to respond. Because I mean, how do you respond when someone comes to you and says, I'm thinking about taking my life? How do you talk about those things to young people? As I finished school, I got this $20,000 law scholarship. And so I decided I was gonna study law at university. In my first year, I did really well. Second year, midway through the year, I had quite a significant breakdown. I struggled to get up in the morning. I struggled to leave the house. And I ended up dropping out of uni. So for six months, I was re-nourishing myself with my family. So trying to get back into routines, trying to do what I loved, you know, like playing with Lego. History has always been one of my passions. One of the things I collect is military uniforms. This is like an American Air Force jacket, former like 1950s New Zealand electrical engineer's uniform. Yeah, I kind of am just interested in these things which speak of the past. So this is something I saved. It's like a copy of old newspapers from 1953. And so in 1953, a number of important things happened in the world. Edmund Hillary climbed Everest with Tenzing Norgay. But the one that really stands out is when the Queen was crowned. I'm not a royalist, but I'm still interested in the key events that shape the world. I collect the stuff because I get nervous that people will um, forget about the past. I got a call in February 2018. The New Zealand government had asked if I would be interested in being on a panel doing this big review into mental health and addictions. It's the biggest review in 22 years and the biggest review in New Zealand's history. So the government chose six of us. One of them was Sir Mason Jury. He created this model which a lot of people use every day called Whare Tapa Whare, which still talks about the pillars of life. And then other people like Professor Ron Patterson, who was an ombudsman, uh, Dr. Jemaine Teatia Seif, who's a, a huge Pacific academic. So how do I share the voices of children, youth and young people amongst the most amazing leaders? They made it really easy. They were so inclusive. While I was 22 and while I was a student, it wasn't just for me to ensure that children, young people, students' voices were heard, that actually they had a responsibility to do that too. All of us carried all of it. I've found that we're at our best when we're partnered with Komatua. If we're not getting enough younger people alongside our current leaders, learning about the way things are happening now, and then together shaping what could be, and it won't take long before we don't have the pipeline of the next people.
Finding your identity is one of the most important things I think we can do in our life. If we don't love who we are, or we don't love our heritage, it can make our journey and the opportunities we have much more reduced because we aren't willing to draw from or to be part of a side of our life. So for me, continuing on the journey to be comfortable in all of who I am is me feeling free, I guess. Ko ngā tāngata e matatoa ana ki te hinga ka hua tike tike. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.